Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we're going to learn just how dark and dangerous some people can be, especially in challenging situations. I'd also like to take a moment to introduce you to our guest narrator, Somba Reads. If you enjoy his work, feel free to check out his channel. The link will be at the end, as well as the description. But for now, it's time for you to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Back in 2004, I worked for a popular Canadian company that sold cell phones slash cable slash internet and stuff. I worked at a location in the city's local mall for a few years, and over the course of time, I got to know and build rapport with the customers that I saw regularly. There was one customer in particular that I served at least once a month. He would buy a prepaid phone with cash every month without fail. As I rang him up the second or third time, I watched him open up his wallet and saw half inch thick wads of $100 bills. Then it clicked. Monthly burner phones, wads of hundos. He was a dealer, for sure. Now the guy was genuinely a nice dude, always polite, knew me by name, asked how my day was, and I enjoyed seeing him come in. I could tell you countless horror stories of the physical and verbal abuse that we endured at the hands of customers at that location, so it was really great to get to deal with a nice person. And the commission and bump in personal sales was always nice as well. One night, I was at home making dinner. I had the TV on in the background. My program had ended, and the station switched to the six o'clock news. As I sat down in front of the TV with my food, the news station opened with a story on a murder that had happened in the city. Suddenly, my favorite customer's mugshot popped up, and I sat there mouth agape, listening to the details of the story. It blew my mind knowing that I had interacted with him every month for probably a solid year. He's actually out of jail now, got an early release and everything. And while I'm sure I'm not really at risk, I'd rather not meet him again. I live in San Jose, California, and I recently moved downtown. For those not familiar with the area, Let's just say it's not the safest part of town. I lived by myself in an apartment complex. That night, I had one of my best friends visiting from LA. I haven't seen my friend in a while, so we decided to have an old school weed, video games, and horror movie marathon. We're in our early 30s. It was around 1.30 a.m., we're high as kites by this point, and in the middle of some silly horror movie. Now, imagine how the following must have felt. Someone is screaming in the movie. It's loud. Then an intense banging started. Boom. Boom. It wasn't the movie, though. It was the window. My body literally froze. My brain was going at a thousand miles per minute. I look at my friend right in the eyes. He turned pale and literally looked like he had seen a ghost. During all of this, the banging has been going on for at least 15 seconds. My brain couldn't accept it, and I tried to rationalize it by thinking, Oh. Maybe the volume of the TV was too high, so it's just the neighbor complaining. I snapped out of it. There's no way. This wasn't the, hey your TV is too loud type of knocking. This was more like, the I'm coming in type. It lasted for what I thought was forever. I finally found the courage to yell something. All I could come up with was, Who is it? Then more banging. 
I didn't have the courage to go look through my blinders, so I rushed into my room. I own a 9mm pistol, so I grabbed it and waited. I was terrified by the idea that I would have to make a life-changing decision if this person would have broken in. The banging stopped. I told my friend we should rush outside of my apartment, go to the secondary entrance of the building. That way we could see who's in front of my window. But at the same time, he, she, or it would be at a safe distance from us. I drop my pistol on my bed. We rush outside. We open the building door. We see the most basic white dude ever on a bicycle. Of course, that makes sense. This idiot is banging on the wrong window. That's a huge relief. Yo, you got the wrong window. I yell at the dude. Huh? He says. So I asked if he was banging on my window. He says, Oh no man, that wasn't me. But I just saw this really sketchy dude walking that way. Yeah, sure you did buddy. I thought to myself. He had a door fob so he apparently lived here. We went back to my apartment having a laugh. This guy couldn't even admit he messed up. A couple of hours go by. It's around 3.40 a.m. now, and the munchies are hitting hard. Thank God for the vending machine on the third floor. We get in the elevator. Life is good. The door opens up. Sitting on one of the chairs, there's a guy with a thousand-yard stare. He was wearing a beanie and a long coat. I immediately knew he didn't live here. I immediately knew it was him. The basic white guy wasn't lying. I didn't say a word. Neither did my friend. We kept walking. He stood up and entered the elevator. All I told my friend was, damn, that guy looked really sketchy. I didn't want to panic him nor panic myself. As we arrived at the vending machine, we both, almost at the same time, said, it was him. We then hear one of those emergency doors open. He walked up the fire escape. My friend grabs a small plant, ready to bash him over the head with it. We're cornered, and there he is. He walks in. There's only a ping pong table between him and I. He kept his hands in his pockets while walking my way. Is he holding a knife? I can't let him get to striking distance. How's it going, man? I said, while walking away from him. He's young, around 5'10", stocky body type. His face doesn't look healthy. He mumbles something I can't understand, followed by, Why are you walking away? I ain't no popo. We did one full circle around the table. No panic yet. We keep walking while he slowly follows us. We open the door that goes to the pool side. He immediately rushes to it so he wouldn't get locked outside. As soon as we turn the corner, we sprinted, rushed to the other side to re-enter the building and go down to my apartment. I open the emergency door and there he was. He had predicted our move. He was 20 feet from us. We rushed back to the other door. And yet again, he rushed back there. By this point, I yelled, I called the police on you. I was bluffing. 
We had one way out. Down the dog walk that would lead into the street. We sprinted like our lives depended on it. Because it really felt like it did. We're rushing down the stairs five steps at a time. We're rushing down the stairs five steps at a time. Smash open the door. We're finally in the streets. We run around the building and finally manage to get to my door. I don't drop my keys nor miss the hole. It's a smooth door unlocking. I had piercing focus somehow. We're in. We lock the door and call 911. The operator tells us they had received multiple calls from my building. Apparently the guy was banging on people's door like a maniac. After one and a half hours, finally SJPD shows up. We search around the whole complex. One of the officers tells me that it took so long because some guy has gone full joker on his wife. Carved a smile on her face. I was kind of surprised the officer shared that with us. Didn't think they could. As if our night wasn't creepy enough. We obviously didn't find anyone. The funny part of this is, when we got back, we realized that my friend had ran the whole time with the plant in his hand, the one he was supposed to use as a weapon, and brought it back to my apartment. The unfunny part of this is that my friend left the next day, and my window still faces the streets. The streets that the long coat guy is still roaming. About two years ago in the middle of 2017, I was in a really bad place mentally. I was just starting to recover from a crippling addiction, and I was finally beginning to get in a good place and staying sober. For some background, I just had my firstborn child. My boyfriend, our son and I were living with my dad in a rather large house. This was due in large part to finances. My small family and I couldn't afford to move out on our own yet, even though we knew we needed to get away from my dad's craziness as soon as possible. My boyfriend was in between jobs and he was applying everywhere, but didn't have a lot of luck. My dad, unfortunately, was still very active in his addiction and had a bad habit of allowing streetwalkers he seemingly randomly found to come and live with us. My dad invited a couple who we all call Sarah and Adam to live with us. They were also very active users and would often loudly fight as well as assault each other. We begged for them to stop, but our pleas fell on deaf ears and I was afraid to call the police because of my young son. I knew they would call CPS and that they would want to take my son away. I had a bad feeling about living with our Sarah and Adam. I begged my father on several occasions to make them leave and move, but he refused because he was having an affair with Sarah and wanted her to leave her boyfriend to be with him. I'm sure this caused many of their fights. My little family tried our best to stay to ourselves. We stayed in our one bedroom, thankfully. We had a full bathroom attached to it, so we didn't share it with anyone else. I would always even go so far as to keep our bedroom door locked when we weren't home. One morning, my boyfriend left early for a job interview at a local restaurant, leaving me and our child alone in our room. I stayed in the room with my baby, not leaving as I had everything I needed to care for him. Diapers, wipes, clothes, clean bottle, formula, crib and everything. Let me briefly explain the setup of our rooms. Our bedroom, as well as the couple's bedroom, were in the back of the house. Our bedroom came out to a long straight hallway, and at the end of the hallway were the couple's room. I would open the door and look straight out and easily see inside of their room, because where they were staying, the door would often be open. Suddenly I heard a scream from their room, in the hallway outside the room. I step out, after making sure the baby was safely in his crib, I checked what was going on. Sarah is hysterical and talking rapidly. I couldn't understand what she was saying, but I could make out there was something wrong with her boyfriend. 
Looking back on everything, she was probably high. I rushed down the hallway, past hysterical Sarah and into the bedroom. I don't know why I did this. I should have just taken my baby and left the house, but I guess instinct took over when I knew something was off. I see Adam is laying on the bed motionless and he's on his back. As soon as I see him, I know something's very wrong. His skin was a deep unnatural gray color and he was so still. I rushed over to the bedside and touched his chest. He was so cold. There was no warmth left within him. I placed my fingers under his nose to check if he was breathing. Nothing. Placed my fingers on his wrist to see if I could find a pulse. Nothing. I placed my head on his chest to see if I could hear a heartbeat or detect the rise and fall of a breathing chest, but there was nothing. No breathing, no pulse and no heartbeat. There was just stillness. His body wasn't even trying anymore to produce even slow, ragged breaths. He was that far gone. He was dead. Looking back, I knew as soon as I saw him that he was gone, but I didn't want to believe it. I'd held out hope that he had merely passed out. The whole time I'm doing this, Sarah is running around me wildly screaming and crying. I can't remember if I told her to get my dad or if she called him on his own, or if he just heard the commotion and came to check. He was weird and calm the whole time, but I could remember my dad's reaction wrong maybe. To be honest, I don't remember a whole lot of his reaction. From the first time I saw Adam, my mind and memory were a blur. I then rushed back to my baby boy. I was terrified at this point. Maybe I was in the wrong, but in that moment I was more worried about my baby than Adam. I calmly gave my son to my brother, who happened to be visiting us, and was hiding in his room the whole time, somehow unaware. I quickly filled him in. I knew my brother was safe, as he has never done drugs in his life, so I felt comfortable leaving my son with him. I knew my baby would be safe. At this point, after making sure my son was not in any immediate danger, I knew what must be done. Even though I didn't want to call for help because I was afraid they'd take my child. Sarah is still running around screaming and crying, and my dad is just silently standing around. Perhaps he was in shock. And I tell Sarah to dial 911. I think I ended up making the call, and a short time later paramedics and police are swarming the house. They tried to resuscitate, but we all knew it was useless. He was gone from the moment I walked in, and had probably been gone for hours at that point. Eventually CPS showed up, and my worst nightmare was realized. They took my baby. My poor boyfriend came back home from his job interview, which he got by the way blindsided with ambulances and police in our yard. He had no idea what was happening as I didn't have time to call him and fill him in before he got home. They eventually ruled Adam's passing as an accidental overdose. I don't know for sure if it was accidental because Adam had talked before about how unhappy he was and wanted to leave Sarah because he knew she was cheating on him, but he had nowhere else to go. I don't know, maybe I'm reading too far into it. I didn't know him very well, and we certainly weren't friends. The story doesn't have a happy ending. I'm truly sorry that Adam lost his life to the disease of addiction, but I couldn't help but be angry with Adam and myself. I'm angry for what he did, accident or not. I don't know if it's right or wrong of me, but I'm also angry with me. I feel like I could have done things a lot differently if I hadn't been struggling with addiction myself, and they may not have taken my son. I'm still sober, and my boyfriend and I are married now, and we're fighting our state for custody of our son, and we will keep doing so until he is home again. I no longer speak to my father. My boyfriend and I had moved out of my dad's house that day. Thankfully, he had family who let us stay with them until we got on our feet. My dad and Sarah got together almost immediately after Adam's passing, and they're still together. Their relationship is uber toxic and has caused many problems between us. Be careful who you allow into your life and the lives of your children. I was driving home through back roads I had never been on and came across a bookstore in a tiny town in the woods. The bookstore was actually a house where the front of the home had been converted into a store. There was a box on the porch that read, 
50 cent books. So I stopped to see if there were any Stephen King books in there. A middle-aged woman comes out with a huge smile and gives me a bowl of fruit and some tea. I'm like, this place is awesome, and rifle through books while eating the fruit and downing the tea. Inside the store, there were a lot of cool art books and stuff, so I spent some more time in there. She brought me more tea. Even when I said, no thank you, that's plenty, she still kept refilling. Gave me dessert too. Brownies and cookies. I didn't realize at the time, but she was drugging me. It's hazy to remember the details, but at some point, she closed the shop, telling me to take my time looking at the books. She told me that she was going to take a shower and was gone for a while. When I was ready to pay, I had to wander back through her house to find her. I told her I was ready to pay, and she showed me how to open the register. So I went and opened it, put in what I thought I owed, took out the change, and left. When I stumbled outside, a fire engine drove by, screaming with sirens. In the distance was a glow of a big forest fire, and the stars were being covered by smoke. A tall man on a horse watched the fire truck pass. He looked right at me, took a piece of wood or something out of his mouth, and said, Town's burning. I swear to God I have a crystal clear memory of this happening, even though I'm sure it couldn't have. By this point, I guess I was seriously tripping balls on something. I'm not a drug guy, so I don't know what I had, but I was out of my mind and could hardly walk. I got back in my car and drove home along the twisting road on tall cliffs above the ocean. Twice I realized I was on the wrong side of the road. One of the times I realized this because a massive truck was headed straight for me, laying on the horn and flashing its lights. I kept thinking about how my car could be like an airplane and a submarine if I drove off the cliff. I can't believe I made it home alive. Later I realized I was in that house for four hours looking at books. At least, that's what I hoped to hell I was doing. I've always had a very peaceful life, raised by respectable parents who lived in a decent town and pretty much sheltered by the evils of this world. When I was in my early 20s, I had a few friends. They weren't bad kids by any means, but didn't use their heads and chose the best people to choose to be around. One night, my friends Zach and James were out cruising around. Now, Zach and James did have an issue with drugs. I was never so easily persuaded by peer pressure, nor pursued a life to impress anyone. However, I had no problem standing my ground with anyone. Sometimes it's best if you walk away from any situation that you feel could go wrong, which is something I should have done that night. Luckily, I'm still here to share this story. I was out cruising with Zach and James, and they make poor choices in life. They decide they want to score some dope from a friend called Carly. She was an okay person, just another soul who became an addict. I was okay with going, although it was never my kind of scene. However, when I arrived, there are some people that I'd never met before. Have you ever met people and you instantly just get bad vibes from them? Well, this is one of those moments where you assess a situation and know you should just say, Hey, I'm going to go see another friend and walk away. I had that feeling that these guys aren't good people, and I should have listened to my gut instinct, but didn't. We walked into Carly's house, and I just got the sense that these people aren't the kind I want to associate with. Instead, I sit there and wait for Zach and James to do their thing and get the hell out. 
Well, it's not going as fast as I would like. That's when a guy called Ricky starts asking me a bunch of questions like where I'm from and who do I know. I'm sitting there playing it cool, listing off some people I know. There was one person who was known well, an old baseball team member and schoolmate, who was a very troubled soul who got into plenty of trouble. Do you know Bishop? I said. That's when the Q&A session stopped and became a heated ordeal. I guess Bishop and Ricky had some beef with one another, and things escalated quickly. Ricky began making threats towards me, saying he was going to call up one of his friends which knew the friend as well. The other one was well known for violence, and he was from the same small town as I was. Me being an idiot, I stood up and continued the senseless argument with him threatening me, and that no one would ever find me when he was done with me. I foolishly spout back the same ignorance to him, despite it not being my nature. At the time, I just thought if I stood my ground, I would get respect. Carly's mum came in the room and told everyone they need to calm down and ask me to leave, to which I happily obliged. Fast forward 10 years in the future. I moved from my home state to Illinois and came back to visit family and friends. I was talking to my friend Jared, who was one of the closest friends I had for about half my life. He brought up the fact that Carly had passed away from an overdose, and he said, Did you hear about her boyfriend Ricky? I said no and asked what happened. Apparently, he had taken a girl from a local university, a ballerina, and the specifics of what he did to her are too horrific to mention. But let's just say her remains were found in the woods. He was caught, convicted, and is now serving life in prison. Sadly, Carly and Ricky had a child together. Carly, of course, passed away, and the child's father is serving life in prison. My friend Zach also passed of an overdose as well a few years back. The world of drugs is a very dark place, filled with people who are just as dark as the world they live in. Take my advice. If you find yourself in a situation you feel is uncomfortable, and possibly dangerous, just turn around and leave. I got lucky, as things could have been much more deadlier. I was 15 and had just moved to a new town right in the middle of the school year. I met some kids that seemed cool and took them up on their offer to hang out and spend the night at one of their houses. The evening started off great. The host mom made pizza for everyone. They had a pool table and even a PlayStation. I was having a lot of fun. When they all decided to head up to Mike's and try to buy some weed. I had not been around drugs at all, but was feeling rebellious and nervously went along. It turned out that Mike lived in a questionable trailer about 15 miles out of town in the woods with somewhat of an entourage of seedy figures. He was a formidable character, lanky, wide-eyed, and rail thin with a nervous way about him that instantly put me on edge. I'm a big guy and he instantly started sizing me up, grabbing my shoulder several times and squeezing my arms. He said I looked like a fighter and asked me if I wanted to fight him. I declined, but he kept telling everyone I was going to fight him. I'm sure I was visibly nervous, but my friends just laughed it off and asked if they could buy some weed. He insisted that we have a drink first. I had also never drank, but I did my best to choke down the warm beer that was shoved unceremoniously into my hand. I took in my surroundings as we drank. There were tin foil and glass pipes on every flat surface, at least three guns, and the rest of the adults looked like they were well ahead of us in the consumption department. My friend insisted on getting the weed, but Mike kept telling him not to be in a hurry. He brought out a bong, lit it, and started passing it around. This was the first time I smoked weed. 
He haggled me over how I wasn't inhaling enough, and then laughed like a hyena when I had a coughing fit. He kept making comments on how I was big and acted tough but I was really just a big wuss. He also made comments akin to taking me in the back room and making a man out of me. One of the tooth-impaired women began some long monologue about a man's G-spot being located rectally. I wanted to leave immediately. I took the first opportunity to tell my friend that I thought it was best we leave. And now. He finally convinced Mike to retrieve the weed for purchase and an exchange was made. I tried to walk out, but Mike slammed the door when I opened it. He started insisting that I was a narc and that I needed to strip naked so he could check me for a wire. This went for a few minutes as I just stood there uncomfortably, hoping he would end this little joke and let us go. Finally, he said he'd known I wasn't a narc because I was going to smoke meth to prove it. I looked at my friend and just shook my head, but he was either too stoned, too apathetic, or just thought Mike was being funny. Either way, there was no help there. Mike disappeared to the back room while the three men that had been sitting on the couch got up and pushed the couch in front of the door laughing and telling us to sit down and get comfortable. I had a hallway behind me and walked down it, looking for a way out. There was a small laundry room at the end. There was a small laundry room at the end, and to my relief, a door. It was only to my relief until I seen that not only did it not have a handle, but it was nailed shut. Mike began yelling for me to come back to the living room. My brain was in a tailspin. Fight or flight. Fight or flight. Do something. Move. I kicked the door. It opened. There were no stairs, so I jumped down to the snowy ground and began to run. I ran into the woods grateful that I had not removed my coat in the warm house. I heard a commotion behind me as Mike screamed obscenities at me. I kept moving. Then I heard several gunshots. My heart was beating out of my chest. I had a general idea where the road was and headed in that direction, avoiding the meandering lane that led to Mike's trailer. I slipped on the hillside several times, but... Luckily, there was enough moonlight to navigate through the trees. I heard a loud truck start up and then more yelling. I was leaving a trail, but I couldn't avoid it. Eventually, I reached the frozen dirt road and started walking back towards the highway, staying in the trees. I saw headlights coming and hid, hoping that it was my friend. It wasn't. Neither was the next one. I continued walking. It's worth noting that this is years before I had a cell phone. After about four miles, the road met the highway back to the town. It was harder to avoid walking on the road at this point. It was clear for quite a ways on either side. But when a car came driving by, I ducked down in the snow on the shoulder, trying to get my head just high enough to see, hoping it was a police cruiser. I did this several times, my jeans soaked, me shivering with cold and fear. It was about the fourth time or so I did this that I noticed that the car was driving much slower than the 65 miles per hour speed limit. Was this Mike? Coming to kill the suspected narc? I stayed low and prepared to run. As it got closer, I recognized my friend's minivan. I stood up and waved and hoped for the best. My friends had told me that the scene inside the house had turned into absolute chaos after I kicked the door open. Mike had gone ballistic, 
screaming that I was a narc and that he was going to kill me. He had picked up the gun and pointed it at my friends, telling them he was going to kill them for bringing a narc to his house. They insisted I wasn't, and that he had just scared me. He then stomped down the hallway and fired a gun several times out the door I had kicked open. My friends took advantage of the moment to pull the couch out of the way and run out the front door, jumping in the minivan and tearing off down the lane. After turning onto the road, they seen headlights behind them and intentionally killed their lights and turned down someone else's lane. They waited a while and then went out looking for me, driving up and down the dirt road and the highway, absolutely freaking out and not knowing what to do. They apologized profusely and insisted that nothing like that had ever happened before. We were all pretty relieved to be back together. Not long after this, Mike and several others were arrested in a drug sting. I was worried that he thought I had something to do with this and hoped he wouldn't be holding a grudge and want to come looking for me. A lingering fear that eventually subsided. Until one day, a couple years later, I was working at the local grocery store, and here came Mike, looking a little worse for wear. He looked right at me, and my heart stopped. You're a big kid, he said. You play football? If you'd like more stories from this author, be sure to click the link to their Quora profile in the description box below. I am a 21-year-old female and moved to a new city last year for work. I had a lot of trouble finding a decently affordable place to live, so at the time, as I now have an affordable house to rent, I found a small apartment on the edge of a bad part of town, but it was affordable and newly renovated. Initially when I moved in I had no issues, but soon discovered that the couple upstairs were a little rough around the edges, always screaming at each other, throwing things, slamming doors, and it made for a lot of sleepless nights. One thing I found out was the guy upstairs was a dealer, and this is important when we get to the main part of the story. One night I had got home from work pretty late. So by the time I finally cleaned up dinner and started getting ready to sleep, it was around 10.30. I had just laid down in bed when I heard a knock on the door, and honestly, I shouldn't have even considered opening it, because, well, three things. It was 10.30 at night, I wasn't expecting anyone, and to get into the building and up to the apartment doors, you have to have a key or have an apartment buzz you in. Still, I made my way to the front of the door and cracked it open and found a man, probably in his late twenties, wearing a black hoodie and jeans, rocking back and forth in my doorway. As soon as he saw the door open, he leaned right in, trying to push his way into my apartment, repeating the same sentence over and over. I need to talk, Brad, let me in. Obviously, I didn't want this guy in my apartment, so I'm just trying to shove the door closed while telling the man that no Brad lives here, it's just me. This went on for what felt like forever, but probably lasted no more than a few minutes. Suddenly, he stood up straight and just walked away and said nothing. I was a little shaken, so I went into my room and just sat there for a while, wondering why the hell I would open the door in the first place to a stranger. I ended up hearing a commotion from the lobby area and went down and saw how this guy got into the building. The glass front door was completely smashed, which explains how he got in. Going back to the neighbor upstairs, and this was someone who regularly bought from him, who was coming into the building trying to find him for some reason, that I can only imagine was pretty sinister by the way he was trying to get into my apartment. Hopefully, we'll never meet again. Back in my early 20s, I moved to Melbourne to go to university because of some of my dodgy friends I knew from outside of my university. I somehow wound up as the guy to go to for drugs with my classmates. I hated the reputation. 
but maybe felt a little bit cool at the same time. Ecstasy and speed, mostly. I was at the bottom of the drug dealer food chain, and the type of idiot who jacks the price up $10 a pill, mainly so I could have enough money to drink and party. I had no guilt ripping these people off. These were mostly rich kids who lived with their parents and didn't have to work to support themselves through university. Dealing them drugs was so easy and non-threatening. A few years after I finished at university, I was working an office job that was boring and paid peanuts. By now, my friends and I had pretty much grown out of the desire to take drugs on weekends. My drug dealing days had well and truly finished. It was 11 p.m. on a Tuesday night. I just got home from a draining day at work and was exhausted and in a bad mood. I plonked myself on the couch and stared at the ceiling, trying to muster up the courage to get up and shower before bed. My phone starts flashing and vibrating on the coffee table next to me. I looked at the caller ID, and it was T-Bone, the nickname I had for a guy I met at a festival years ago and ended up spending a bit of time with here and there. He was a huge, friendly, weed-smoking, acid-tripping hipster with an impressive beard. I hadn't spoken to this guy in well over a year, so when I saw his caller ID on my phone, I immediately thought, huh. He probably needs drugs. I answered, and we exchanged some pleasantries, and then I could hear the tone in his voice change to that awkward, hey, could I ask you a favor? Kind of tone. He wanted drugs, and a lot of them. $2,000 worth to be precise. When I asked him what specifically he wanted, he just said, as many ecstasy and bags of speed that I can get. He laughed. This was way outside of my comfort zone. Even when I was dealing back in uni, 10 pills was usually the maximum I would offload to anyone at any time. It was late. I was tired. And figured that I can clear an easy $500 after purchasing from one of my guys I used to buy from. I told T-Bone that I would call him back and see what I could do. To my surprise, the first person I called was Stover, and he was able to help me out, and he was only a five minute drive from me. We discussed the terms and conditions, which seemed reasonable. 60 ecstasy and 3 grams of speed for $1,500. I called T-Bone and he was happy to part with the $2,000 for this amount. I met Stover out front of his luxurious apartment building. We had a quick chat and he joked about wanting to meet the guy I'm selling to. We shook hands and I was on my way to T-Bone. I asked T-Bone where he wanted to meet, and he told me where he was. I Google mapped the address. It was a 45 minute drive from me. Had I known he was this far away, I wouldn't have agreed to sell him anything, but I couldn't back out now. The address he gave me was in what was probably one of the worst neighborhoods in Australia, known for its violent crimes, murders, and of course, drug dealing. For anyone reading this living outside of Australia, they certainly don't show this in tourist brochures. I also won't mention the name of the place because I don't want to offend anyone reading this that might live there. I started the journey. I now had plenty of time to think about how stupid I am. I had a ridiculously illegal amount of drugs on me, and I was driving out to the roughest neighborhood in the country. After ages of sitting on the freeway, I took the exit and was approaching my destination. At this point, I was so tired that I was in an almost dreamlike state. Every set of lights I pulled up to, people in cars next to me would give me greasy looks, trying to act hard and start a confrontation. I pulled into the street where the house was. 
Your destination is on the left, my phone told me. The street was so dark because the street lights were out and there was cloud cover, so no moon. The houses on this street looked dilapidated and abandoned. This didn't feel right. The house T-Bone said he was at had boarded up front windows and graffiti tags on them, and there weren't any lights on. I called T-Bone. No answer. I redialed and thought it was about to ring out when he picked up. Hey, T-Bone, I'm out front. Okay, cool. Come in, he said. No, you come out to the car, I replied. Hang on a sec, he said and hung up. I was thinking. I hardly know this guy. He had been at a few parties I went to. We hung out, but I don't know anything about him. I saw him emerge from the side of the house, pushing through bushes that blocked the pathway. It was the only car parked on the street. He saw me and gestured for me to come over. I had no idea who he was with. I had no idea who he was with, so I thought it was time to get into character. I took my jacket off so I was only wearing a white singlet and put my filthy black trucker cap on that I kept in the glove box. I was hoping this would help me look a bit more intimidating. My friends often joked how I look tougher than I am. I have some football and kickboxing induced facial scars, combined with a pretty large physique from smashing weights for years. I was big enough and scary looking enough to be intimidating. But truth be known, I'm really a marshmallow who avoids confrontations. I shook hands with T-Bone in the front yard of his place. I felt at ease when he gave me a happy greeting and thanked me for coming out this way. He told me to follow him, and we went through the bushes around to the back of his place. I could hear music. Sounds like they were bumping dubstep through distorting speakers. I could hear a few people's voices. I could hear a few voices, and I could smell cigarette smoke. T-Bone ripped the back door open and the smell and sound hit me harder. I've been to some nasty house parties, but this was horrific. There were three of them in the kitchen. There was a flashlight attached by string to the 12 foot ceiling, swinging back and forth slowly, like a pendulum. This was the only lighting. The swinging light made it difficult to see the people in the kitchen, but with each sway, I would catch a glimpse of their faces. They were absolute toothless junkies, all shirtless and skinny, with bad tattoos. We entered the kitchen, and one of them closed the door behind us and stood in front of it, arms folded as if he was guarding it. One of them came forward and told me his name was Jay. Not like he was introducing himself. It was more of a statement. His face was full-blown meth. He sized me up and looked at T-Bone and said, I thought you said this guy was a punk. T-Bone looked at him in total shock. As Jay turned to T-Bone, the flashlight swung past and I noticed he was holding a big screwdriver behind his back. Now I realized what was happening and I felt like an idiot. I've walked into an ambush Get a guy with a ton of drugs and come around and rob him. Jay turned back to me. He was about six feet away from me. He showed me the screwdriver and said, What do you got for me? With a big toothless smile. The fact I was so tired and pissed off kind of worked for me because I didn't show I was scared. I squared up to him and said, in a nonsense tone, Give me the cash and I'll show you. To Jay, which replied, Nah, T-Bone told me that these were on loan. I looked at T-Bone who looked back at me and shook his head and mouth. I'm sorry. Jay looked at me with such hatred 
It looked as though he was in pain. Give us the drugs. If it wasn't so dark in here, he would have easily seen my overinflated pocket where the drugs were stashed in an envelope. I looked at the guy in front of the door, and as soon as our eyes met, he put his arm over the door handle, confirming that he wasn't going to let me leave. We all stood there trading glances. The swinging light made everyone's shadows look like they were moving. Jay didn't like this. T-Bone broke the silence and said, Jay, chill out, I'll get the money. And he left the kitchen. I thought he was going to bail on me. Jay slowly came towards me, pointing the screwdriver at me. He said in a raspy matter-of-fact tone, I'll kill you. I've done it before. Try me. That's cute, I replied. Then the painful anger came back into his face. I've never seen anything like it. I slowly put my feet in a fight stance to prepare myself for what was about to happen. T-Bone walked back in and said, Here's the cash, which briefly diffused the situation. I did a quick count. It was 1700 Close enough. I threw the envelope of gear to Jay, and the door guard moved and I got out of there. T-Bone followed me and he tried to give me an apology. Dude, I had no idea this was going to happen. I'm so sorry. I just said, you owe me $300, and drove away. I never got the extra $300, and I never dealt drugs again. I also, thankfully, never met Jay again. Five years ago, I was a dealer. Nothing big. I sold about 3k of the green stuff. Normally, my dealer would come to my apartment and give me 100 kilos, but he didn't have that much, so I had to drive to the next big city to get more. So me and two friends went to Stuttgart to meet a friend of mine. He lived in a social apartment which was paid from our country. It was a big house with at least 50 little apartments. It was like a guest toilet. There was a big bed and a TV right in front of it, nothing more. It was the smallest room to live in I'd ever seen in my life. On the bed, there's a topless guy, pierced and skinny as hell. Completely on speed, bumping around the bed, watching a blue screen on the TV, and listening to hard trance. The room was a complete mess, medication and cigarettes everywhere. I was scared to sit on the bed and didn't want to sit on a needle or anything, but I did it anyway. We spoke a bit about how it's going and stuff, and he told us that he was robbed two days ago, and showed us the weed and mollies. Weed was in a tobacco box on the floor and the molly on top of it. Two minutes later, there was a knock on the door, when a little 16-year-old kid appeared and then vanished. All of a sudden, the door rips open and then two of the biggest guys I've ever seen came in, screaming at us and telling us to get on the floor. I wasn't sure what was happening. They were wearing weird combat clothes, as well as having weapons under their belts. Why are you dealing on our boss's territory? They said. Me and my friend sitting next to each other looked on the floor completely dazed and froze. I liked... They searched the room for everything and took it all from him, slapped him in the face and screamed at him. At the same time, in my hands and in my jacket, I had 2,000 euros, hoping they wouldn't find it. Suddenly, one of them grabbed a Coca-Cola bottle and told them to turn around, but the other said they had no time and they left. Scared as hell, we looked at each other completely out of our minds and said nothing. They must have been high as well. Unfortunately for them, they didn't see what was actually in the middle of the room in the boxes, so our deal was good to go anyway. The only thing I was worried about were the two Goliaths waiting for us to come out. So the dealer guy called a friend who was living in the same house to protect us while we left, 
but nobody was out there when we drove home safely. My other friend waited outside and screamed at us for waiting that long. I almost hit him in the face when I told him the story, which he didn't believe at first, but we insisted it was true. I hoped to never see those guys again, and I'd stopped doing this after that. It's so scary. Last summer, my friend Aaron and I were both interning in Washington, D.C. for separate companies. My friend left first, May 18th, and I flew in two weeks later. For the first two weeks of the internship, Aaron lived at his uncle's apartment in Northern Virginia, before moving into summer housing at George Washington University, shortly before I arrived. Because he was the only permanent intern in his office, and because he had yet to move in with the other students his age, Aaron was quite lonely. Roughly a week into his internship, he got a message from an old boss a few years his senior, John. John said he saw Aaron was in D.C. through Facebook posts and offered to grab lunch and hang out. Aaron, not having anyone else to talk to there, was more than glad to accept. They met up and chatted. John said he was still working at the digital advertising company he had come out to D.C. for and was having the time of his life. He suggested Aaron come over to party at his place that next Tuesday at a condo in Anacostia because Aaron was alone without friends in the area. For those unfamiliar with the D.C. area, Anacostia is a historically African-American neighborhood in the southeast quadrant of the city and not typically a place where you'd find a pasty white guy like John. This location set off a small alarm bell in Aaron's head as the firm John was working at paid its staff well enough that they could afford places outside of Anacostia. He asked me to chat with one of my co-workers at the internship who coincidentally had been friends and co-workers with John back in our home state before they moved out to work in the before they moved out to work in DC. I asked my co-worker about John on the first day, Monday, and he said that he had practically fallen off the face of the earth a few months ago. Nights at his apartment had stopped without warning, and he had sizably dialed down the contact he had with my co-worker and other people in his circle. I also found out that the apartment my coworker mentioned John lived at was in Adams Morgan, a higher end neighborhood than Anacostia. It turned out that my coworker didn't know John had moved. Further research that John was working for a telemarketing firm now, instead of for high powered political consultants, and that while he was registered to vote in Anacostia, it was not at the address this party was supposedly going to be held at. Tuesday came, and Aaron went to Anacostia, but got cold feet and went back home, telling John that he had forgotten about a summer school assignment that was due. In reality, the thought of going to a party on a Tuesday night, in a seedy neighborhood, all by himself, was too disconcerting for Aaron. John understood, and told Aaron there'd be another thing on Friday. I thought this was the end of it, and that Aaron would leave him on Reed. But instead of backing out, Aaron pressured me to join as well over the course of Thursday evening. I was quite resistant to the matter, but he got another friend back home to help persuade me. We informed her of our plans and that if we didn't text her by midnight at the end of Friday to start worrying and call the people in D.C. about our last known location. Aaron also dangled a sizable amount of weed over my head to get me to agree. I had only had it once before that summer, but just a few hours after arriving, Aaron introduced me to his edible of choice for the past two weeks. A Corova Blondie containing 500 milligrams of THC in it. 
I took a small piece of the edible on the Sunday I flew in. And wow, once it kicked in, I was tripping. We went to watch game two of the NBA finals at a sports bar and everything in my field of vision was swimming. Ordering food was hard, as was eating and keeping my balance. Typical background noise registered as the sound of waves crashing against the shore for me. But the most jarring effect this blondie had on me was when that conversations around me sounded like they were taking place in Russian. I could pay attention to one person and hear English from them. But anyone else would be speaking Russian. Conversations would change languages if I stopped paying attention to them and focused on something else. I was incredibly messed up as a result of taking this blondie, and this is pertinent to the story at hand. Friday rolled around, and I met up at Aaron's dorm. He texted John to make sure he could bring me along, and got an odd response. Something along the lines of, That's okay. Does he not have other friends he could hang with on Friday? Or are you the only person he knows here? This put us somewhat on edge, but we still had our friend back home who would raise hell if we didn't get in touch with her by midnight. For added security, I messaged the guy I was renting the apartment from that I'd possibly be going to Anacostia that night for a party and to call the cops if I didn't get in touch with him by 1am. We told John about our blondie and asked if we should bring it with us. He responded with, There will be tons of weed, drinks, and girls here. No need to bring it, but definitely come messed up beforehand. This was another concerning response, as a nerdy-looking telemarketer living in one of our poorer parts of D.C., who had cut off contact with his friend group in the area, almost certainly couldn't put on a party like that. Hell, I don't even know if he'd want to. It's far more befitting of a college frat house, not someone in their mid-twenties who wasn't much of a partier in college. These two started to sow some doubt in both of us, but we pressed on. Taking the blondie, we worked on some homework and grabbed dinner before leaving around 8.20, before leaving around 8.20 p.m. to get to the address around 9 p.m. On the way to the subway, we text John again, who said he was driving around picking up stuff for the party and wouldn't be able to let us in, but someone should be there anyway. We got on at Aaron's local shop and took the train over to the East Plaza, where we'd have to change lanes. All the while we felt the weed slowly ramping up, but not kicking in full force. Seconds after getting off the train, I felt the weed kick in but almost instantly a stronger force came over me as well. I became acutely hyper aware of my surroundings and my brain felt like it was starting to think and process faster. I felt capable of writing pages and explaining the pros and cons of going to the party or bailing, analyzing the likelihood that John was going to kidnap us or was just down to hang with us. I was thinking through and visualizing every possible outcome while I initially thought this weird burst of productivity and hyper-awareness was a byproduct of taking the weed. I've never experienced anything like that since. It felt surreal and also incredibly scary, as if not using every last fraction of this burst of thinking would doom me to being kidnapped or killed. We got on the train to Anacostia and Aaron got rapidly more scared about the situation. My burst of hyper-awareness had reached its peak and I told him I wasn't comfortable continuing further. He was still slightly hesitant and offered that we get off at Anacostia but not leave the station, instead asking John to walk with us to his house. Before we could text John of our new plans, he texted us angry that we weren't there. The people at the condo have said you haven't got there. Why? We explained our mild hesitation about the neighborhood, 
This was my first time in the area and asked if he could drive to the station and then lead us to the house. I'm not driving, but sure. Had to work late and I'm currently on the subway home. About half an hour ago, the story was that he couldn't let us in because he was off buying stuff for the party, driving around. Now he's working late and riding the subway home and somehow able to send text messages from the subway, which doesn't have that decent of a connection. I explained this discrepancy to Aaron and we agreed we needed to bail. Right around then, my hyper-awareness sensation dissipated rapidly and I turned into the same stone lunatic I was last Sunday. Heard stuff, felt dizzy, could barely think. For some reason, despite all of this, we wanted to wait out to confirm that John wasn't on his way. So we stumbled away from the turnstiles and towards the end of the station, where the rear end of the eastbound trains would be when they arrived. We waited a bit and got another message from John. Just go to Navy Yard. Should be there soon. After a few more minutes, an eastbound train arrived. A few people got off, given that this was late on a weekend in a residential area. There were very few people getting off, and none of them were white men. John hadn't gotten off at the station. Just then, a text came in from John. Just got off the train. Should be at the turnstiles in a minute. Stay there and we could walk to my place. This was way too much for both Aaron and I. Our eyes didn't deceive us, so we bolted onto the train and left the station. He hurriedly wrote something to John about me throwing up because of how strong the weed was, and John said it was disappointing that happened, but understandable. Maybe I'd want to go over to his place to rest. We ignored that text. In our hurry to get out of that situation, we didn't realize we had gotten on an eastbound train, which was taking us away from both of our apartments and deep into southeastern Maryland. We got off a few stops later and hopped on westbound. The weed was at its peak when we returned west, and we grabbed something to eat. I left Aaron and stumbled to the metro, which was incredibly hard to do without a friend helping guide you. Signs were blurry. My mind was spinning. And it was hard. I finally got home at around 12.30 a.m. A few weeks later, Aaron got one more text from John, empathizing that we couldn't make it to the party and offering to take Aaron hiking with him in rural West Virginia preferably without Hunter. That text was also ignored in the number block. I had siloed this story away for the past year, but decided to look John up out of sheer curiosity, and I was floored to find out he's doing quite well for himself. He's at a different political consulting firm, no longer a telemarketer, back with his former circle of friends and in a stable relationship with someone. Maybe we were just far too paranoid from the super powerful edible to think straight. But Christ, there had been so many red flags that night. John, I really hope you're doing well for yourself. But just in case, let's not meet. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Somber Reads, and I also have a storytelling channel here on YouTube where I narrate everything from creepypasta to Reddit No Sleep. If you're looking for more of the paranormal and supernatural aspects of storytelling, consider subscribing to my channel by clicking the link in the description box below. I would like to thank Mortis Media for giving me the opportunity to present myself in front of his adoring fans. Stay spooky, everyone. <laughs>